Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'm very flattered to be invited here, first of all, from the meeting, and also to give this talk, which makes me very nervous. There are some people in the audience who will criticize what I'm going to say, because I'm going to try and explain to you what it means. You don't remember when you were a single cell. You came from us. I mean, I still, even as a developmental biologist, I still regard it as absolutely amazing. We come from one tiny single cell of fertilized egg. And it took a long time historically for that to be recognized. It was widely thought for many, many years, for hundreds of years, that all human embryos had been created by God. And uh, they were there. And it's only about 150 years ago when cells were discovered and so forth that it was recognized that actually we, we, we came from a cell. It, it really is um, a, a thing. So I, I, there are a lot of people running for president who don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to get into the religious <laughs> basis of this. But just, I assume you don't know any developmental biology, so I'm hoping not to bore you, bore you to tears. But just let me remind you, if you go to a simple, there are a number, just let me tell you, there are a variety of animals that we look at when we look at development. We look at frogs, we look at flies, we look at a particular little worm, and, and so forth, and uh, uh, the thing. And if I can just remind you that if you go to the frog embryo, um, it actually has some differences top to bottom, even when, when the frog egg is laid, it's pretty big and yolky, then it divides into a lot of, of smaller cells, yes, and that's called a blastula, you don't want to know about the, yeah, no, you might as well learn these names, that's a blastula. And then you get a process which is very important, um, and I have a quotation saying it's not birth, death or marriage, but gastrulation that's the most important event in your life, and that's gastrulation. <laughs> And that happens in which a group of cells here move into the embryo, and that's gastrulation, and they give rise to the three basic types of cells in your embryo. There's a group of cells called ectoderm that gives rise to the skin and the brain. Then in, that's all on the, from the outside of the embryo. Then on the inside of the embryo, there are two classes, mesoderm, which gives rise to the muscles and bones, and then there's the endoderm, which gives rise to the gut. And, and of all animals, there are these, you get gastrulation and you, to get these, the different, the, the, these, th these three types of cells. Now, what I think it is also important to realize that from a very early stage in the frog and all embryos, you can make a fate map. You know, you can mark cells, there are clever ways of marking cells, and see what they give rise to. And by the way, you must interrupt me. If you don't, if I, if you don't follow what I'm saying, don't hesitate. I'm a South African, I'm not English, so I do, embarrassment is not part of my life. <laughs> Just bear that in mind. So you can, you can make a fate map of the embryo, and you can show that this region will give rise to an eye, for example. Okay? And you can also show that that region, if you plant, transplant it in the, at an early stage, you know, into another region, it'll give rise to something else. But at a later stage, if you transplant it, it will be determined at that stage, and therefore it will only give rise to an eye wherever you transplant it. So you have a fate map in which the cells are not determined as to what they're going to give rise to, and but which at a later stage they become actually determined. And I can just want to give you another example of gastrulation. I don't want, but, but, but it just gives you a feeling better of what, of, of what happens. I'll do it over here, actually. And that's the sea urchin, because it's nice and transparent. And you have a, a layer of cells like that. So the cell divides, it gives you a hollow sphere. And then the cells down here, a group of cells move in, and they're the mesodermal cells, and they migrate to all different parts of the thing, and the way they migrate is by putting out structures called phylopodia. They put out structures, they attach to a particular site where they can adhere, and they pull themselves to this. And they take up a pattern determined by where they make the best attachment, so they make a very nice pattern here, and they'll later lay down the skeleton. 
so that you've got you've got your mesoderm now the ectoderm is the outer thing and that will remain there and then the gut forms by it forms an invagination like this and it begins to move in and then it puts out phylopodia to here and it pulls it up to the top fuses here and that's the mouth so now you've got the anus the gut and the mouth and that's gastrulation in the sea urchin it just gives you a feeling and we understand moderately well the mechanics of, the, of, of those things but the real point about development is the cell and really cells I regard as more complex than embryos the interactions between cells in the embryo are trivial by comparison with what goes on inside the interactions between the components the components of the cells um, uh, now genes I regard as boring <laughs> They do absolutely bugger all. They sit there like telephone numbers. That's all they do because they, find they provide the code for proteins. And if you want to pray to anything in the embryo, it's proteins that matter. So genes do absolutely, you know, they're along the chromosomes, along 25,000, you've got about 25,000 of them. But they do absolutely nothing. They are red when proteins come along to a particular gene to a region called an enhancer. Have I spelt it? Yes, I think I have. Enhancer. A protein come here. It can turn on this gene, and that gene will then be transcribed. It will give the code for a particular protein. And it's proteins that determine how cells behave. And that's why I really want to say, and what obsesses, well, lots of the people at this meeting are talking about two things. The region where factors called transcription factors, proteins, where particular transcription factors bind to the DNA in regions called enhancers to either repress that phone number or to turn it on. And this is an enormously complex system. Uh, it's not something that I work on, but it really is very important. So transcription factors bind to specific regions called enhancers in the DNA, and that determines whether a particular protein is actually made. And it's important to realize that the DNA, however important it is, even if it's boring, is um, not a blueprint in any way whatsoever. Um, the best way to think about development of the embryo is not in terms of the DNA providing a blueprint. It's like origami. Do you all know origami? You know, when you, when you, and that's what it's like. So things are much more complex w when you do that. So the proteins uh, uh, pro provide things in that sort of way. And also, there are signals between cells, but that's quite complicated. First of all, there are very few signals other than hormones that actually, when it goes from one cell to another, gets inside that cell. It binds to the membrane, and that triggers a particular set of reactions. And I think there's a wonderful Rube Goldberg cartoon which illustrates this nicely. There's a man with an umbrella over his head, and he wants the umbrella to be raised when it rains. And the system that is set up is the rain falls on a prune, which expands when it rains, which turns on a lighter, which lights a little um, candle, which then boils, or heats a kettle which boils, which then blows a whistle. And this frightens a monkey who jumps off a swing, and this leads to a cord being cut, and the umbrella can go up because the birds fly up, and therefore he's covered by the umbrella. Now you may think that that's complicated, but if you come to signal transduction in cells when, when something binds to the membrane and what its consequences are, it's a bit like that. And when it, this was once shown to someone who worked on this, he said, no, this is a lousy model because if, if the chimpanzee isn't there, it wouldn't work. And we certainly know with signal transduction, if you take away just one factor, it'll still work. It's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a co co complicated thing. 
And I think it's very important to realize that you can use, that, and it does happen in development, there are certain um, signaling molecules. Let me tell you one. One's called sonic hedgehog. Or, why, oh, by the way, you should know that in development, the names of things, if you discover a gene, you can call it any damn thing you like. <laughs> you, you, you'd, you'd think. And many of the genes that are, that are in your were originally discovered, you see, in the fly, in the fruit fly, which is a, a, a very important model, and then a rela related gene. And the gene Sonic Hedgehog, there was a gene discovered in the fly called Hedgehog. It made the larva look a bit hedgehoggy, and they called it hedgehoggy. And then someone looked for this in, uh, in, in vertebrates and found the same gene, and he was he's a hedgehog, and his child was playing a game called Sonic Hedgehog, so he called it Sonic Hedgehog, <laughs> and that's what this gene is. So Sonic Hedgehog is involved in many systems in your own development, and you can use the same signal again and again, because when that signal arrives at a cell, how the cell responds is determined by its history. At one stage it will do one thing when Sonic Hedgehog does it, at a later stage if they're a different group of cells, they'll do something. So the history of the cell um, makes, 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 makes things very different. Okay, if we now go to probably the, the most important model um, um, in development, people may argue about this, just let me take this off, is of course the fruit fly. And the point about the fruit fly is that first of all it lays an egg. It's a big cell. It's a big cell. And what happens in, this, in the fly is that a protein called a transcription factor, that I think, called bicoid, is actually graded along, this is a single cell by the way, the nuclei divide, the nucleus of the cell divides, but they don't make membranes around it, so you get a multinuclear, lots and lots of nuclei around like that, okay, but there's this bicoid gradient, and that's very important because it turns on at a particular threshold a gene called hunchback, so hunchback is made there. And this is really the beginning further than genes are turned on uh, along this axis. And this is a very important model. And what, what, what happens there is later on, because of the different genes being turned on here, you get a system in which there are stripes of a gene called even skipped seven stripes of a gene called even skipped. Now, it's amazing because people thought when they saw that even skipped stripe that the only way that this pattern could be formed would be to have some molecule, something like that. Do you, do you understand what, what I mean? But it ain't like that at all. Every one of, there's only five and there should be seven, that's six, seven. Every one of those stripes is specified independently of the other by the transcription factors provided earlier. I think it's probably the most, one of the most important concepts in the whole of developmental biology that these seven stripes Everyone, I am aware of the fly people in the room. I'm getting it right, aren't I? Is there a fly person in the room? <laughs> yes, um, you'll, you'll correct me, don't it? You know, I'm not a fly person. I'm, I'm, all, I'm almost a chicken, but... <laughs> now, the next important thing... But I mean, could it be that originally, that originally there was a mechanism like that, but then basically the fly evolved to have a faster way, and so then therefore made... Well, I don't, well, well, well <laughs> we won't get involved with that. But anyhow, that's the way it happens in the fly, which is absolutely amazing. I think it's absolutely amazing. Then the next thing that, that happens in the fly, a little later, it actually becomes segmented. In, in this, sorry? It becomes. I just had a question. Please. Independent. So does that mean that if I do something on the second, you know, I, I 
somehow modify the environment on the second half, or let's say the right half of the wing. The it's not a wing. This is still the end. This is the main body. Okay. The left half of the yeah. cell that the right half develops independently? These are totally independent of each other, yes. How do you show independence? Independence. I can't think of it. You can get rid of one. I mean, or you can take it in hand and it will only light up one square. You, you can look what genes are turned on in specific regions. It's, it's pretty well the, uh, sorted out. That's, we, we, this is standard stuff. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, absolutely standard. And then comes the next major discovery in the fly, um, which really got them a Nobel Prize. It was Johnny's, wasn't it, the Hawks? The Hoxies. No, this was this is, this got the Nobel Prize. No, I can't remember. It doesn't matter. But um, <laughs> but the important thing to realise is along this axis of the fly with the, with its segments, a set of Hox genes are activated. Now Hox genes. You can spend your life studying <laughs> Hox genes, and if you're Denny de Boule, you do. <laughs> um, it's very important because what these Hox genes do, they give the can determine the character. It will determine later on where legs will grow out and where wings will grow out. So the Hox genes, and the other remarkable thing about the Hox genes is that the order of the Hox genes along this axis is the same as the order of the Hox genes along the chromosome. It's the only example where there's any relationship between the order of genes along the DNA and the order of the, of the structure of, of the things in, 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 the, in the animal. But Hox genes are absolutely fundamental. And just let me give you uh, uh, an absolutely one, a wonderful um, e e example. Um, flies have an antenna and legs, yes? If you change one Hox gene, yes, a mutation in a gene called Antennapedia, instead of an antenna growing out of the head, a leg grows out. And that's changing just one Hox gene. Now, how that does it, we really don't understand. And Boris, I think that the transcript number of sites that the trans... You see, the Hox gene just gives one transcription factor, and it's got to change all those ones in, in the thing like that. It's absolutely, it's absolutely amazing. Um, Okay, that seems, so that's the thing that determines with the legs are. If we, we looked, if we go now instead from the fly, we go to vertebrates. Gastrulation isn't quite like that. Because what happens in vertebrates, I won't take you through the details, but you end up with a sheet of cells which are effectively the ectoderm, the future ectoderm. And from one end, a streak develops. It starts here, and it moves across. And at the tip here, there's a node. It's called Henson's node. And that's an organizing region. And let me tell you what I mean by that. If you take that node and graft it to a, in another embryo to this side here, you'll get another primitive streak development and another little embryo will, 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 will develop there. What's more, if you go at this early stage and you cut this thing, this is forming like this, and you cut this into, into at least, well, I don't know, into two pieces, each piece will give rise to an embryo. And what I haven't told you and meant to tell you, that one of the most important experiments done over a hundred years ago was done on the sea urchin. When the sea urchin egg divided into two, the first cleavage, Hans Drisch separated these two. 
-hmm. And instead of getting two small, you know, half animals, he got two perfectly normal sea urchin larvae, but smaller. So what it says is, you can get the identical pattern with half the size. And that's what gave rise to me to think the best way of thinking about it, or the best comparison, the best comparison is that patterning in the embryo is like that of a flag, because the pattern in a flag is independent of its size. And I want to tell you, identical twins in humans are, ident are the same. They're half the size, yet give rise to exactly the same proportions. And that's why it's a bit like a flag. And to say that we understand how this works, I'm afraid is not is not is is is, is not is not is not the case. Um, also, we go back to our we'll go back to our primitive streak here. Yeah? So this node is an organizing center. Yes. Well, you, if you, if you wake up and divide into four cells. Sorry. Separate. Yes, even at the four cell stage, you get four. Yes, I just checked it up. Yes, um, you will still get four tiny um, sea urchins larvae. Sorry? Oh, because if it divides, I checked it up. I think here's the sea urchin egg. It has an AP. It has a, a polarity along here. The first cleavage is like that. The second one is like that. But the next one's like that. If you separate these two, they'll develop quite differently. The animal and vegetal halves will develop quite differently. But it's still, you can get with a fawn. Drish did this about 110 years ago. And he actually thought, he came up with the idea that the only way this could happen is that the cells had a co that the embryo had a coordinate system. And that's how the cells knew what to do. And he said, but that's impossible. And he called it entelechy. And he said it was mystical and that there was no possible way we could ever find out how it worked. But nevertheless, his stuff was, was very interesting. It was a very important experiment. If we now go back to vertebrates, and once again we look at our primitive streak developing, several things, first of all. Cells move into the primitive streak, and they pass through it and go down to the layer below. And this process is gastrulation, and it gives rise to the endoderm and the mesoderm. And also the axis is now specified along here. And once again, Hox genes are specified along this axis. And you can see it better here. I'll, I'll do it better one here. Oh, no, I can do it on here. Yes, you get Hox genes along there. And so these Hox genes determine where your neck vertebrae will be, it determines where your arm, where your arms will come out, it will determine where your, where your hips are, and once again the order of the Hox genes is identical to the order of, the, of where they're specified in, in the embryo. And the structures that also develop at this particular stage, I should tell you, are things called somites. So if we, if, if we make the axis this way, there's the node. As the, I'm doing it badly, sorry. I'll do it this way. Sorry. A little noise? Sorry? Many animals have bilateral symmetry. Yes. Is there a different gene that determines where the right leg will come out and where the left leg will come out? Yes. Um, well, of course, we have bilateral symmetry, but our heart is on the left side. And we have quite a good understanding of left-right asymmetry. Um, quite often it's related, it's, it's a complex story, but um, in certain cases it's cilia beat in a particular direction. And I came up with a model many years ago that the way you get left-right asymmetry, yes, that's the anterior, that's the posterior. If you've got a set of molecules with an F shape and they align themselves along the AP axis, you see you've got a difference between left and right. And basically, I would still say that that's the basic mechanism. And cilia are asymmetrical, 
uh, asymmetric like those F-shaped molecules, and they beat in a particular way in, rela in relation to left and right. It's more complex than that, but uh, it's not an unreasonable way. I'll come back to symmetry later. Um, okay? Um, and also, as what happens is this, remember Henson's node was here, it regresses. And as it regresses, it leaves on either side a group of structures called somites. And those are the ones that give rise to your ribs and things like that. And what kind of thing they make depends on what Hox genes are, 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 are there. Now, I think what you can see also is that change in shape is very important in the developing embryo. And the reason this is because cells migrate, they, ex they exert thing. And I think one of the best ways of thinking about this is if you've got a sheet of cells, And this one contracts here. There's a localized contraction here, there. Then the sheet will bend like that. You happy with that? Sort of. But that's the way it more or less works, I, 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 I would say. And of course, cells migrate to all sorts of different places in the embryo when they, when, 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 when they need to. Oh, I, I don't want to bore you. Uh, there are all sorts of um, neural crest cells that come up at particular times that migrate to all sorts of things. Also, cells have on their surface cell adhesion molecules. And that determines how well they stick to each other. And you can take two different groups of cells from different parts of the embryo, separate the cells, yes, mix them all together, and they'll sort out. So the one group will be on the outside, and the other group will be on the inside. It depends on how well they stick, how well they, well, well they stick to each other. I think there's also a very important concept called convergent extension. And that is, given a sheet of cells, the cells will now, these will move inwards and these will move upwards, and it will take on a shape like that. And that's moderately well understood, and that's convergent extension. They converge towards the midline, and I think in order to do that, you really have to set up the axes. And setting up axes, is not that well understood. And it's just worth, please. Earlier you said that after uh, the cell type is determined, you can move the cell around the eye, so. Yes. And it still become an eye. Yes. Because it eventually migrate back to where it's No, eventually. no, no, no. No, you can get an eye forming in all sorts of funny parts of your body. Not in humans, but in frogs. Oh, no, no question about that. No, no, it will not move back to its right place. Um, uh, now, it's just worth trying to tell you, you care about your nervous system. And the way the nervous system thing is in a migration is you have a sheet of cells at the top of the embryo like this. And what happens is that they begin to bend. Oh, gosh, am I going to draw this? Um, how in the hell does it go? Um, that's right. On the one side it comes up, and the other side from here, they come up, and this forms a tube. In other words, two regions come up from there and from there, then they fuse in the center, and that's going to be your spinal cord and your brain. And that, that's, moder that's also moderately um, well understood. Moderately well, that, that's okay. And then another process, which is very important, is differentiation. That is, cells becoming different from one another. You've got about 200 cell types in your body. Blood cells, muscle cells, cartilage cells, gut cells, and so forth. And what that involves is really turning on the right genes at the right time and inter complex interactions between the cells. And, and, and that's, 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 that's the thing. And as I've already pointed out, there are in relation to the, to the, to the genes an enhancer region, which determines whether a particular gene uh, will, will be turned on. And it's quite nice that how much we understand. There's, I think one of the nicest examples of understanding a little bit comes from sickle cell anemia. 
there's a mutation in the gene that codes for hemoglobin. And the result of just a single mutation there makes the hemoglobin in the cell pack together in, a nor in an abnormal way, and therefore it makes the, the red cell a bit abnormal. And so when it goes through the, 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 the blood vessels, it doesn't flow that well. And it's one of the few examples where you actually know the sequence of events from a mutation to an actual change in form and how it can affect an individual. The other thing is, of course, if you've got sickle cell anemia, malarial parasites don't like you and you're actually saved from malaria. So sickle cell anemia is quite common in countries where malaria is, is quite a thing. And then related to this are what is probably one of the hottest topics in developmental biology, and that is stem cells. Stem cells. Now what are stem cells? As you're sitting here now, in your skin, there are cells which do this. Here's a cell here. It divides into two. One of these becomes an epithelial cell on your cell, and this remains a stem cell. So it's a cell that divides in which one daughter remains a stem cell, and the other daughter becomes something else. It can become a skin cell in your gut, it becomes the lining, a lining of your gut. And stem cells are an impossibly hot topic because if you go to, if you go to the early mammalian embryo, early human embryo, you can take out from them a group of what are called embryonic stem cells. And these, if you put them in culture, will give rise to every type of cell that you know. And people think that for helping people with all sorts of problems from Parkinson's disease to heart attacks, that by making cells do things, you can rescue them. I think it's oversold. Nevertheless, it's no, wouldn't you agree, it's probably the hottest topic in developmental biology. I mean, it, there are meetings morning, noon, noon and night on them. And it's certainly very impressive what you can do with stem cells. But I don't think there are many examples yet where stem cells, putting these embryonic stem cells into a person has really rescued them in any particular... It, 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 cured, Sorry? it cured a mouse from sickle cell anemia. It, it did cure a mouse. <laughs> Good. Well, there you are. It did cure the yeah, mouse. Yeah, Janis you know? Janis Nusslein. No, we don't Janish. Uh, Janish, of course. No, he's very good. Like taking skin cell, making IPS, sure. fixing the mutation, and biting to the mouse, and killing the mouse. <laughs> yeah, making blood cell first. Well, they are, sorry, sorry it's, everyone has very, very high hopes of curing many, many illnesses with, with, the, with these things. It's also important, please. That means that any skin cell can become a stem cell. Well, now, now what is remarkable, you don't have to go to the early mammalian embryo, human embryo, to get stem cells. We can take one of your skin cells, and because they're cleverly, you can put in four particular transcription factors, and it behaves like a stem cell. It's absolutely amazing. So these are made stem cells from your skin cells, and so from also from a rejection point of view, immunological, it's very important. Please. So when a stem cell divides, you say one daughter is essentially yeah. differentiated and the other yeah. is stem. What the term? Well, what segregates all of the changes so that they don't both get well, well, usually it's because where they're localized. It's the niche in which they're found. Mm. I would say yes. But there are cells, sorry, there are many situations where cells will divide asymmetrically, nothing to do with the immediate environment, but because there are ways in which different proteins are put in one half rather than the other. Um, it's also worth remembering something. You are suicidal in every poss possible way. That is, all your cells have a suicide 
plan. It's known as apoptosis. I won't spill it. But every cell practically in your body is capable of committing suicide. And presumptive cancer cells, the cells that think it's going to become cancerous, they kill themselves. And the way the digits in the limb are separated are by the cells undergoing normal death, apoptosis. And that's the difference between you and a duck. But also, <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't want to do that. It's also worth noticing that if we go to the frog embryo and we take out the nucleus, yes, and then we go to a skin cell from the frog and take its nucleus and put it in there, and this is called cloning, how will it develop? And this is a very controversial area, cloning. You can get, it will on occasion give rise to a normal frog. In other words, it will change all the things that this nucleus that you've transplanted was in the skin and all the proteins it was making related to the skin. You put it into the cytoplasm of the egg and it now becomes an egg nucleus thing. Now with humans, I'm pleased to say you... Sometimes it happens. So, well, it's not terribly now you can clone all sorts of animals now they claim to have cloned horses and they can clone dogs but now you can do quite well but with humans I'm pleased to say it's absolutely impossible so far and all the evidence is that if you could clone a human that human would be very abnormal so you say it's absolutely impossible so far that many people have tried yes oh yes Oh yes, and I'm absolutely against it because the child will be abnormal. And one of the reasons will be abnormal, I don't want to get to the thing, there is in the development of germ cells like eggs and sperm, there's a process called imprinting in which various genes are turned on and off. And because you haven't been through that process when you do that, you get abnormalities. So uh, it's not an ethical issue, it's simply totally dangerous to try and go through. Is it so different between a horse and, uh, and another mammal? I don't know. No, I, I can't remember. I think horses have been cloned. Am I right? Sheep and cows. Sorry? Sheep and cows have been cloned. I'm not sure about horses. Sorry, I just can't remember. Uh, and we don't really know. And monkeys have been very difficult to clone too. Uh, I don't think they've done... Pr uh, uh, primates have been very difficult to do. And just why that is, we, I don't know. It may have something to do with the, imp the imprinting. I just don't know. Could it be just a numbers game? I mean, obviously with humans, it's a lot harder to get numbers. Well, well, with humans, I'm totally... Yes, the child will be a... You know... I, I'm not promoting it. No, no. I'm so sure that it would be abnormal because mice uh, have imprinting. Well, all the evidence is... All the evidence so far is that it will be abnormal. But is this something people publish papers on? Oh, yes. And say, we have tried to clone... No, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember, this in the famous case of Dolly the sheep. Dolly did badly. I just wonder, questions about humans, because Dolly's going to publish papers and say, No, most people accept that it would be very, very dangerous. <coughs> And the child would be abnormal. Yeah, mouse can be cloned, but they are a little bit abnormal. They are abnormal, That's absolutely. It's hard to say how that would be human. No. Should I go in a few more minutes? Can you offer us some intuition for what imprinting is? Imprinting is in the development of germ cells, for example, in the mouse. They, in the mother, she turns off certain growth factor genes because she doesn't want her and the embryos in her to grow too much. The male keeps it on. But there are about a hundred imprinting factors and we don't really understand their function. But she turns it off and the... And the male leaves it on. In the embryo. She leaves it in her germs, in the egg it's turned off. Yeah, because she doesn't want too much growth. The male on the other hand says, damn you, I want as much growth of my offspring as possible. <laughs> Well, because it damages her, she wants to get out. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we've done that. And then, uh, I don't want to get too involved here, but the system that I work on, 
um, is the development of the chick limb, and I'm quite involved with what is called positional information, um, and uh, you know the French flag, uh, a sort of thing, and the way the limb develops. Oh God, um, the, the limb grows out of the body of, of, of the chick, and there are two regions. There's a thickened ridge here, which makes a protein called FGF. And there's a region over here, another signaling center, which makes sonic hedgehog. And I'm not going to take you through this, but this sets up a positional system, a coordinate system, I claim. This is controversial. I'm delighted to talk about this for hours, but I don't think you want to hear it. This is probably all right. And what happens if you take another embryo and you have two of these, then instead of having a pattern of, uh, of digits that go four, three, two, it goes four, three, two, two, three, four. So it signals like that. But the, it, it, it's complicated. And what determines the pattern along this, the position along this thing, we have a story called the progress zone. It's how long the cells remain in that region. The cells that come out first will be proximal cells. Those that stay in longer will be distal. It's controversial, and I'm not going to take you through it. In the nervous system, and the nervous system is very, very, very complicated, to put it mildly. And the first of all, you, you, you identify how many different cell types there are in the nervous system. Nobody really knows. And one of the main things that they've got to connect up, and so here's the cell body of a nerve cell, and it has a long structure called the axon, and it migrates long distances. So axons from the eye go to the brain, and they connect up with specific regions. And the pattern of axons from the eye have to migrate to the brain, and they have to make connections with the right regions. And that, 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 that is moderately well uh, uh, understood. <clears throat> and then briefly, there's sex. What makes you male and female? It's the X and Y chromosome. It's very boring. Females have two X chromosomes. Males have XY. That's all there is. And so male sperm determine your sex because females are XX. So all eggs are, have an X, yes? Males come along, either it'll be an X or a Y, and that's what determines uh, what, what, what happens. And then finally, a tiny little bit, there's growth, and growth is very important. And everything, growth only occurs quite late. All patterning and everything that I've been talking about happens on a very small scale in the embryo and then it can get bigger. And uh, it, it's very important uh, to, to realize that. And there are some cells, like the liver, for example, if, you only put, and there, if there are only a few liver cells in the embryo, the liver will grow to the right size, it regenerates. But if in the embryo you only have a few, um, if you only have a few pancreas cells, will have too few pancreas cells. There's no regulation for the number of pancreas cells. And my final thing, two final things. First of all, I shall tell you about regeneration very briefly. It's very, very important. And the work of Jeremy Brox is the following. He has discovered that along the salamander limb, there's a protein called PROD1, a membrane protein, yes? And it's graded from here down to there, yes? If I cut the limb here, yeah, yes, no, well, no, I cut the limb here, normally it will just regenerate a hand, yes? But if I cut the limb here and treat it with retinoic acid, the prod one here will go up to here, yes? And so what it will regenerate when you cut here is a whole new limb. It's so it will go humerus, radius, ulna, hand, humerus, radius, ulna, hand. So one of the best examples of positional information down the limb is in fact prod one. And then finally, although it's not related, and so you mentioned symmetry thing, I give you the following problem to which no one has given me a solution. Please hold out your arms. Same length. Grow for 16 years. 
they don't talk to each other, how in the hell do they end up the same length? Thank you very much. <laughs> I just published it in a paper and I give it to students, I give it and not a single, well, it just means that it either could mean that everything is so, so, but it's very complex because the way your arms grow, there are growth regions in different bones, it's all the bones, and there are growth plates in different, how in the hell, did, 16 years it grows for. I mean, you could argue that, that the hormonal system which is shared across the body has it. Sorry? You could argue that growth hormones. Yeah, but how in the hell does it, but how do, how do they respond in exactly the same way for 16 years? So in the interest of full disclosure, last time, uh, uh, Louis, uh, a few years back, um, you know, invited the audience to, to do that uh, in the main seminar room. There was one young fellow <laughs> whose left arm was about two inches longer than <laughs> for something like that. That explains the mechanism for breaking. The yes, yes. And then you predict that half the population will have the heart and the left and half of the brain. No, 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 because it binds always in the same way. I know, but the mirror also binds. Yeah, but the, the, the mirror image doesn't, it's, no, it's very it's rare. It's really, it's a very different mirror. Yeah, well, it's a... You are feeling the part of Oh, yes, there's no question about it. No question. The mirror image of that binds us to the question. Sure. So why, why don't half the people have mirror images of the mirror? I don't have a good answer. Most people look at the fire. Why don't they go without a mirror? Well, but you can't change the wall. Okay. How does that work? Yeah. Looks like a paper. Can't look at the book. There are inorganic examples of this kind of two arms the same as a snowflake. It's interesting. Not going. Very symmetrical. Very, very symmetrically. There is no communication between one side. Oh, but this is not a snowflake. Well, I just don't. We, but I just can't tell you. For 16 years, there's millions of cells dividing in different parts of the arm. How in the hell do they all end up with exactly the same things? The even weirder thing is that so many developmental processes depend on mechanical signals, and at least yes. in humans, one of your arms is getting a lot more mechanical signals than the other if you favor one. It doesn't make any difference, yeah. <laughs> You're right. Could you also argue that twins have usually the same length of yes. arms? Yes. So it's not even, they don't, there doesn't need to be any communication, but no. maybe just genetic problems. Probably. Well, it's all very clever. Cells are very reliable. <laughs> It's your time for one more question. Sure. So you didn't mention wound healing. So who? Wound healing. So if you no, I didn't mention wound healing. So if, when you read the literature, frequently biologists will say that the developmental toolkit at the molecular and cellular level is the wound healing toolkit in adults. Is that? Do you believe that? I'm not very good on wound healing, but it's just the skin cells. So the cells move over the wound and, and heal up. <laughs> but, but I don't think it's much developmental. But not always regenerate. No, no. But if you cut off a child's fingertip at a very early age, it will regenerate. <laughs> so, what's your take on the animals that very stereotyped body plants, which is landmark of the, of the species, but plants are much more plastic. What do you think is the fundamental difference? I'm not good on plants. <laughs> but they do very well. <laughs> And, um, you know, they don't move. It's all about growth. It's all about cell division. All right, you can have lunch. <laughs> 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 <laughs>